So welcome everybody and thank you so much. We have today an amazing panel, uh, four incredibly smart, dedicated uh, change makers that will really make a difference in what they're saying. Our topic today is developing a new morality for a post-COVID world. I'm Laura Jadaru Koch, founder of Women for Solutions. We are an organization of women and men who are bringing the new economy of the caring economy to the world. So on this, our topic of today is a miss the issues about mismanagement of COVID crisis and how uh, governments are taking advantage or not of uh, the situation and how uh, morale is changing. Is it really changing? So our panel today that I'll mention the names of each and describe each one is uh, going to this is going to analyze and discuss in their personal view and professional view what do they see are changes in morality where do they see this happening and what can what are they uh, contributing to make this solu uh, changing in this uh, in in this um, post covid world new morality So our, our first speaker is Abib Shah, founder of Clutch Group S USA. So I'll mention each name and then I'll, uh, so please uh, uh, Abib, um, 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 give us your five minute uh, introduction of, and, and comments and then we'll go for the next panelist. Thank you, Laura. It's uh, lovely to be with you and uh, my fellow panelists here today. Uh, in terms of my background, I'm the founder and former CEO of an artificial intelligence powered uh, analytics and professional services firm. I currently serve on uh, multiple corporate boards and not for profit boards. On the corporate side, uh, the largest company in the world uh, providing financial crime solutions. Um, a digital transformation provider and an artificial intelligence software company. Uh, on the not-for-profit side, I chair our foundation, which works with a million underprivileged children across uh, 2,000 schools uh, that we have helped transform in India. Um, you know, today's topic is very important. I mean, we're up to 174 million cases, 3.75 million deaths, record unemployment uh, and 20 trillion global bailouts so far uh, and counting, I guess. So the sheer magnitude of the impact and the speed with which it has happened has exposed how fragile our institutions and nations really are. Um, you know, this once in a century black swan event has tested the mettle of leaders worldwide, Laura, as you alluded. And while some have become more authoritarian, revealing their true colors, others have taken a high moral ground in handling the crisis. <clears throat> you know, so one example, um, you know, of this in healthcare is where amidst an overstressed health system, biology met technology in new ways uh, with what we've seen transpire in telehealth and biopharma. In the COVID-19 genome was sequenced in a matter of weeks and the vaccine was rolled out in under a year, uh, which is an incredible accomplishment given it has often taken a decade in the past. Um, so just imagine if these lessons are taken and applied to other diseases, how fast can we develop treatments and save many millions of lives around the world? Um, I'll take a personal example You know, as I'm sure everyone is tracking in the news, India is the new epicenter of the pandemic with a vaccine shortage, overflowing hospitals, lack of oxygen, deadly fungus, and for some, uh, even lack of dignity and death as funeral homes have been overrun. And, and our not-for-profit's mission, you know, as I mentioned earlier, is focused on Um, you know, underprivileged children in education. Uh, but clearly, you know, the right thing to do, uh, the, the moralistic thing to do was to pivot and temporarily focus on COVID relief efforts, which is exactly what we've done over the past year. Uh, and we've, um, you know, distributed food supplies to 800,000 
people most affected by the pandemic crisis for three months, as well as um, PPE to 300,000 frontline workers who are risking their lives every day to fight the crisis. And so, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's really about, you know, coming together and doing the right thing. And, and I feel uh, that the way forward is really to reimagine and rebuild a new normal with resilience, to take the painful lessons of COVID and turn them into effective action to rebuild not just our lives and our livelihoods, but our institutions and our nations. And not only with the resilience to absorb future shocks, but also to build uh, a more inclusive uh, and sustainable economy and society with a higher morality. So I'm cautiously optimistic that with strong leadership from both business and governments, we can reimagine and rebuild a better world, more resilient, more sustainable, more inclusive, and with a higher morality. Very good points, Abby. I think that uh, what you you really encompass a lot of, uh, of of very basic solutions that moving forward. And we would like to hear Gail Kristen Gannon, a managing director, Wave Edge Capital from the USA. Gail, please give us a, a, a short introduction and why. What do you think about this upcoming new morality? Uh, post COVID, and how how are you dealing with it in your company and in your in in solving this issue? Thank you, Lauren, and welcome to everyone again. Um, uh, this is um, my pleasure to be here to talk about this uh, really timely topic. Uh, first of all, like Avi, I do feel that there is a a lot of hope and promise and an opportunity for us as a global community to be more resilient in our nature and our approaches to really solving a, a problem that affects all of us. And um, so with that, to just give you a, a brief background of myself, I've been a serial entrepreneur and angel investor and advisor and Sherba to many tech companies all over the world. And in particular, um, my practice focuses on high potential startups, poised to scale on technology and enabling technology to support global health, SDG and ESG. So over the past 10 years, we've dedicated to elevating women in tech entrepreneurs most recently. And then this is my third time serving on the Harasses panel. And I want to thank Frank and his very hardworking team for the opportunity to intentionally elevate our consciousness. And so as um, Avi had done a wonderful job highlighting um, some of the uh, just really major uh, sort of pain points of, of what we're experiencing now and some of the really interesting opportunities for all of us to really coalesce is, is around uh, focusing on some of the economic and health disparities and, and inequities, um, particularly in the emerging markets, which is hardly uh, most uh, harshly felt, as well as with women who have suffered the most. And with that said, uh, for us and what we have done, and I say us because I work with a number of uh, organizations, uh, not only just myself and on Sante, but also with an, a number of NGOs and uh, businesses and also um, government organizations to help uh, really bring to light. So uh, one of the things that uh, we're focusing on now is actually directed for India. Uh, it's just been uh, horribly uh, shocked at the dearth of, of infrastructures and support in the areas of actually both testing, treatment, and vaccines. And so with that set, um, we're currently partnering with a, a company called Orion Bio, who has developed a novel fluorescent lateral flow rapid test. Now specifically, not only for the point of care, but more importantly, for at-home use, where it can be provided to families where th there's difficult access to healthcare solutions. And so uh, I'm, I'm very positive about this. And we've been uh, lucky enough to actually establish a partnership with the Muslim Dara um, Foundation in Bangalore. And so um, I'm really looking forward to um, uh, bringing that forward. Uh, but there's also two other areas that I wanted to mention too that's become, um, come to light. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, that the emerging markets, emerging countries have been hardest hit. And one of the areas that we've been working hard at is actually the Republic of Georgia. 
in a report like Georgia, as many have known, has been, uh, has been subjected to war-torn atrocities for many years. They've only been out of the war, in essence, for the last 40 plus years. But in the midst of the pandemic, as I was spending time working um, as, as a, um, actually a, a sort of a business coach for many of the startups in the Republic of Georgia under the World Bank Initiative uh, for Developing a Digital Economy, it came to a shock to me that 70% of the food supply uh, was actually imported. So because 33% of the land in Georgia has suffered from pollution or the fallout of war. I was just mortified because if you think of the Republic of Georgia, it is verdant and rich as, as it would be in California's Napa or, so, or Sonoma Valley. And so with that, I am uh, also advising a company called Smartford, which developed a region engineer of bacteria, which significantly improves the soil and crop yield. So I'm, I'm very uh, hopeful that um, now with the pandemic, it's really brought to light that there was a, a, a critical sort of, uh, what would you say, um, critical force behind SDGs and ESG. Uh, and it's not just being sexy anymore. It's actually uh, critically important in terms of emerging markets as well as emerging uh, merged markets in the global economy. And so with that, one more uh, company that I'm also working with, which is um, fairly new and uh, in, into the world. But again, it brings to light, as I said, what pandemic did was it, it showed the lack of access to opportunities and, and fundings and resources for companies who have fantastic technology, but because they cannot play on the global network and they don't have access to partnerships in that way, a lot of the great technology ends up just being shelved. And so another company that we're working with is, is uh, actually called G-Nano, and they're specifically focused on the rare earth metals. Why is that important? Well, as the digital economy contends to be the, the main focus of, of many of the uh, country's initiatives now, that all the technology that we use, all electronic devices, including vehicles, are uh, very much um, reliant on rare earth metals. The challenge is that it's a really dirty business. And uh, so this uh, company has developed an environmentally better way to create rare earth powders. And so I'm very bullish and I'm, I'm hoping that the global economy and, and um, investors in particular help lead the way because a lot of investors, um, I'm, I'm challenging them. And this is, I'm using this as a platform to become more socially conscious in the, the way they invest in technology and know that their impact and in their investments means a great deal, especially to the emerging market. Thank you. Oh, yes, Gail, your your words are magic to my are, are magic to the to the ears of everybody because impact investors should be waking up in a big time in a big way in the next few years because that's the way to go. I think that uh, is no longer about just making money, it's about investing in companies that are actually doing good for the world and to make money. Uh, and um, because uh, also, Abib, also you have this uh, a new vision about uh, social inter entrepreneurs uh, that really want to do good and, 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 and make money. So on that note, I think we should um, listen also to Pam Rand Radhawa, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of em Empirico, a corporation in the United States. Uh, Pam, the la is all yours. Thank you, Laura. It's such a pleasure to be uh, part of this esteemed panel, and and I'm just so humbled by um, all the commentary that has been made so far by Abby and Laura, and also want to appreciate and thank uh, Frank and Horasis for uh, continuing to invite me on these panels, and I learn a lot each time I come. And um, so I am a founder and CEO of uh, Empirical, an early stage biotech company. Um, I also serve on a, uh, a board, uh, Mass Bio, which is our industry association um, for the state of Massachusetts, and and I also serve on a board of uh, um, Mass Life Science Center, which is an investment fund uh, focused on life sciences. It's a $1.6 billion um, that was appropriated by our legislators uh, to really promote the innovation and create jobs and growth uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, we are number one in, in the world in, in the life sciences space, and we hope to uh, bring many technologies to the world. And as you've seen, uh, two of the vaccines that came, uh, you know, they came from companies that have either headquarters here or R&D, um, uh, you know, a, a facility here. And so <clears throat> we, I feel very fortunate to be part of that. Um, many of you raised, uh, you know, uh, brought the challenges of COVID-19. 
you know, COVID-19 started as, as a global health crisis. Uh, it became humanitarian crisis. Uh, and then, you know, it led to more of the economic downturn and unemployment. Um, you know, the moral dilemma for leadership across the globe uh, presented really a trade-off between, you know, saving lives versus saving livelihood. And, you know, I feel, uh, you know, proud to be in the state where the vaccines came from with the emergence of vaccines. Um, soon, you know, it, it, it sort of became that, you know, we have a hope. Uh, but there are challenges as well, uh, you know, challenges in terms of morality that, um, you know, People, those who paid for uh, with their hard-earned money, should they get the vaccines first, or should the people who who need it? Um, it, it is it is a it is a, a real a challenging sort of a topic. Um, you know, specifically when you look at you know we lost what over 3.7 million people uh, to COVID. You know, 173 million people that were infected. Um, not to mention the loss of 4.5 percent GDP, which equate to almost four trillion dollars. And so, uh, you know, loss of life health, livelihood, economy, labor, productivity, you know, supply chain, the list just goes on and on. Um, all of these areas in just one pandemic. And that really is, you know, uh, teaches us this lesson that this has been such an unprecedented uh, event that has taken and really taken, turned over our life. Um, leaders across the, the globe has never seen anything at this scale and severity level. And, uh, you know, there hasn't been any manual to solve this sort of multi-dimensional challenges, uh, you know, that were presented to us. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a massive topic for a discussion and for really thinking about where potentially the solutions can be, where we can, uh, you know, make a difference uh, using our moral compass and, and, and ethical, uh, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities. And, and I think that, you know, this is, this is a sort of a collective effort uh, globally that has to take place and that, that where we can be potentially prepared for future pandemics. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we are doing, you know, Empirico is an early stage biotech company. We have two platforms. We have a drug discovery platform. It's a synthetic liver platform is uh, mimicking the cytochrome P450, which is the liver enzyme uh, processes most of the small molecule prescription drugs or anything that's a small molecule. We mimic that whole process in a, in a test tube and we can predict the drug metabolism and toxicity uh, in, in human. Uh, we, we have done 50 drug metabolism studies to, to validate the platform. And now our first application, and this is really driven by COVID, uh, first application in the antiviral space. We have eight compounds and we hope to have animal data by summer of next year. Uh, what we also recognized is that you know, bringing the affordable medications is, is a one aspect of the overall healthcare, but the diagnostics was the second one, uh, which you have seen many of us experience uh, last year, specifically when we first started, we couldn't get the kits, we couldn't have, uh, you know, diagnostics in time, we, we couldn't, you know, scale those technologies that were available. Uh, we started this long time ago because we really believe in, you know, personalized medicine. We believe in each one of us are genetically different, environmentally different, our pathophysiology is different, and we deserve to have the care uh, that really fits uh, uh, for us that works best for us as an individual. And so we had started this working on this diagnostic next generation platform, um, you know, a few years ago. And growing up in India, uh, one of the challenge always we have seen is, you know, you have remote villages, there's no electricity, there's no running water, there's uh, challenges around hygiene, storage uh, you know, facilities are not that appropriate. So the diagnostic type of devices, um, you know, that require those types of things become really, really difficult. And we recognize that anything we develop have to be accessible, have to be affordable, and it has to be able to implement at a local level with a local environment where you are not going to have highly skilled professionals and you may not have appropriate storage or deployment 
uh, you know, facilities or, or expertise. And so we, we started working on this. And it's really a technology that takes into account of millions of dollars of instruments and how we miniaturize them without losing the performance, but also making them affordable. So, for example, there's a one particular uh, uh, instrument that's a million dollars, and we are we, that's a predicate sort of the instrument that we're modeling after, miniaturizing it but making it affordable so anyone can can actually uh, afford even in, in, in village of India. So taking from that to bringing it to few dollars, individual tests, and trying to make it at home, that this could be a home-based point of care. And that's sort of what we are trying to do with our diagnostic platform. The data between the diagnostic platform and drug discovery platform is shared between so we can develop new applications. So it's, it's our, um, it's our uh, two pet platforms working together, it's sort of a bedside to bench and back. So that means that what we learn in the real world, we apply to the research and we produce medications that are effective for subpopulations and are of are affordable, and then we bring that back to the population. So that's is sort of a, a high level focus of our our, our uh, technology. Um, technology is designed to really look at the how, whether the drugs work in individual early diagnosis, looking at the cross disease analysis, and so forth. So the, there's a whole list of uh, functionality that this uh, particular device uh, can bring. So in terms of looking at, you know, morality, uh, where the industry needs to go, I think that, you know, um, Gail had already mentioned about the new ways of high impact investment. And I think that has to take place. I mean, this was due a long time ago. But with pandemic, I think we are even more in need of, of that, that uh, uh, high impact investment. And investment has to really focus on also that you could develop a technology, a novel technology, you know, in, in a, in a uh, high income countries. But it has to be accessible and affordable and be able to implement at a local level in a low to middle income countries. And I think that, that that's where we're gonna see the biggest sort of the change and these affordable technologies in the area of novel medicine, diagnostics, vaccines, devices or supply chain, workforce development, I think that's a very big one. Um, we also, I also think that um, uh, digi digitalization of, of uh, you know, number of areas or infrastructure, uh, which is like access to data, uh, you know, sec security, uh, you know, cloud, um, and, and overall sort of the healthcare uh, will ha be another area that I think uh, uh, would, would make a huge difference. Um, you know, robust supply chain um, and, uh, you know, technologies that actually can make that happen possible. Uh, you know, robotics, automated robotics, you know, to increase the productivity. Um, these are sort of the few areas that I think uh, that our, uh, you know, world will need in order for us to uh, really be prepared for future outbreaks or pandemic or endemic. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and let the other colleagues you know, speak. And, you know, I'll be happy to comment on some of the areas that I mentioned. Thank you, Pam. That was really very insightful and, and really uh, the big picture of where we're moving towards. And our next speaker is Paul Brandes, columnist of Market Watch in the USA. Paul, the line is all yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Laura. And I have to say that just the comments from uh, Abby and Gail and Pam and you have just been just tremendous. And I've been trying to uh, surreptitiously take notes here while everybody else has been uh, talking. I'll give you just a quick bit of background on myself. I'm a little bit different than everybody else here, uh, I think, in that I've done a bunch of uh, different uh, things in my life. I've worked in asset management and so forth. Um, but for the last few years, I've worked as a journalist, uh, mostly uh, at the White House. I've been there for uh, 13 years now. Not there today. I'm working from home today, which you can 
tell. Uh, but uh, I have covered uh, a couple of uh, presidents now and uh, met uh, six or seven of them, I suppose. And uh, so I produce uh, columns for Dow Jones, which is the parent company of the Wall Street Journal and uh, Market Watch, which is part of that. And also a newspaper here in America called USA Today, which I think by circulation is it's either the number one or the number two uh, paper in the country by circulation. And, uh, and then I do everything from uh, produce uh, television stories for clients and podcasts for clients and uh, this kind of uh, thing. Um, but uh, on the side, though, I'm involved with a fair number of business things that I think might be a bit uh, relevant to what we're talking uh, about here. One thing that I do, for example, I'm involved with uh, a Washington area company called uh, Anywhere and uh, Pam's uh, discussion about uh, the need for uh, products and devices that are accessible and affordable uh, around the world. Uh, one thing we're doing is we're focusing on the problem of uh, safe surgeries. There are millions of people around the world who have uh, uh, do not have access to the kind of say, clean surgical and medical facilities that we might take for granted here in the United States. There are unsterilized instruments and lack of water, lack of electricity, electricity and this kind of thing. So we've developed a product that can be used in the field in places like Africa and India uh, that requires no water, no power to sterilize instruments and it makes uh, surgeries uh, safer. So the goal obviously is to uh, train people how to use this equipment and then allow them or, or enable them rather to perform safe surgeries on uh, patients uh, in places that again, uh, do not have access to clean water or power or that kind of thing. So that's one thing that we're really uh, excited about. It's kind of a high yield kind of uh, product in terms of uh, what it will do, which is save lives. So I think that's a really big deal. And then I work on uh, the side also for a couple of uh, software clients here in Virginia and we in the Washington area, and we use various uh, software products to help uh, schools uh, train teachers how to perform better during the pandemic, interact with students and parents better during the pandemic. And we think that uh, some of the best practices that we've learned uh, along the way are exportable, for lack of a better word, to uh, perhaps uh, school systems uh, elsewhere. So those are just some of the things that uh, I've been doing in addition to the you know, the, the books that I write, I've written uh, uh, history books on the presidency and Jacqueline Kennedy and things like that. That's not particularly relevant to what we're talking about, but uh, I write a lot of history books. Another thing that we're uh, looking at uh, also is something that I think has already been discussed here, and that is uh, the subject of uh, clean water, which is just a, a tremendous issue. We're developing uh, a newsletter and a data-centric product that can raise awareness of water, which is amazing, is a commodity that a lot of people, uh, to, not not in Africa, not in India, not in Pakistan, perhaps not even in China, where a lot of the water is very badly polluted, but in uh, the Western world, it's a product that I think people take for granted, and I think that is wrong. There are uh, major cities around the world, including even here in the United States, that are just uh, uh, heavily stressed in terms of water. So we're developing uh, a product around uh, that. So I hope all of that makes uh, sense. The you know the the questions about uh, the 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 morality and the pandemic. Uh, you know the thoughts that I've had is, and I think we've I've talked about this in the past and. Uh, uh, Gail and I talked about this uh, yesterday, I think. Um, I think that uh, the pandemic has done some things that uh, I think we can learn from, obviously, in terms of best practices. We have to anticipate that there will be uh, future pandemics, uh, possibly worse 
than this. I think we have to do a better job of uh, pre-planning uh, for future pandemics in terms of uh, training uh, nurses and doctors, educating the public, the pre-positioning of supplies, uh, on and on and on. Uh, I think we could do a better job in all of those uh, areas. Uh, I think uh, I'm worried by the fact that the pandemic has uh, highlighted uh, inequality that uh, already existed, but uh, we, uh, I think, have a greater appreciation for the gaps that exist between the haves and the have-nots. A good example of that is here in the United States, where we got off to a slow start last year, I think, in terms of responding to the pandemic, but now we have this a glut of vaccines, and we're sharing them with uh, friends around the world and COVAX, the big international organization, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm also worried by uh, something else. The pandemic has also uh, highlighted the problem of disinformation. There's been a lot of disinformation about uh, uh, what the pandemic is, uh, who or what may be uh, the cause or reason behind it. Uh, it leads to distrust and finger pointing, which I think is extraordinarily dangerous. And again, in a future pandemic, how can we better control, say, the spread of factual and believable and trustworthy uh, information that will help us respond to a pandemic uh, in the future uh, better? So it really does sort of take a, a global village, not to be too trite, a, a global village to respond to these kind of uh, things. And uh, so those are sort of some of the issues uh, that I worry about, the inequality, the disinformation that uh, are really tremendous problems. And they existed prior to the pandemic, of course, and they'll exist after the pandemic has uh, gone away. But uh, we really should focus on how to uh, better contain these kinds of uh, uh, issues, I think. But again, I just want to say uh, what a what a great pleasure it is to uh, have all of you to uh, hear from and learn from. And uh, thanks to Frank and to Horasis also. Thank you, Paul. This is a very insightful what you said, especially we when we had our meetings before we talked about the the issues of the post truth of uh, of uh, of what's going on in the world that people are are just uh, siding on one side or the other for what is the truth without really uh, focusing on scientific background like uh, Gail and Pam and I have mentioned. I think this is very important. But we all know that we have two uh, burning issues in our society that are inequality, as Paul mentioned, and climate change. These two issues are very, very important to, to address. And uh, But we can only address them when we have clarity on 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 what are our moral uh, standards, because the standards is what really pushes forward. So uh, we have a few more minutes left, and I would like to um, uh, maybe open the debate to all of you and, and so that you can make any, a comment about what is it that you see as, a, as a, the next steps or a country or a company that is actually doing the right thing and why. So uh, should we, uh, Pam, do you want to start given that you, sure. yeah, please. Sure, I, I can start. Thank you. Um, uh, Paul, th that was really great. You paint uh, such a, uh, you know, comprehensive sort of a picture. And there are a couple comments that I do have. I want to focus on something positive that did happen. Uh, which was, you know, given that my experience mostly is in the United States, that as much it was a slow start, our government and the industry came together. We have never happened in the history. I've spent my entire career in the healthcare space. We have never, ever produced a vaccine or medication in nine months. And we did that. And that was, that was really a great collaboration uh, we have never, ever, you know, being in the life sciences industry for so long that I've never seen that after you actually even have the approval of the drug that we can produce, you know, such a massive quantity in such a short period of time. That has happened. 
I have never seen that you could actually administer vaccine in millions of people in such a short period of time. That did happen. I have never seen where you have mushrooms of uh, you know diagnostics coming together, uh, and there were like over 400 compounds that were. It was 483 compounds that I saw last checked in October, November of last year that were in the pipeline for as a treatment. These are all the amazing things that took place, and it was the industry, government, private, uh, you know, NGOs, uh, nonprofits. They all came together, made it happen. And you know what? It went through two different administrations. So congratulations. I say that was amazing. Uh, there's a, it really was. Uh, yeah. Th- th- that was amazing. Yeah. And I think this is a once in a lifetime type of an event from all extremes. You know, what happened to all of us and, and what actually the outcome was. You know, pandemic is still going but I think we're gonna make it. I think there's a lot of lessons here that we have learned that when you have a collective effort, there's nothing that you cannot achieve. And I hope that we can continue that one. There's I another think, problem. Pam, I was wondering though, one of the things that, I, that stuck out in my mind is that there was a, definitely an alignment of incentives that really made a big difference. Yes. We, yes. We have the, you know, for good or bad, we have the benefit of having some financial backing that really helps yes. and, yes. and a really a, 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 a sort of the pent up global demand that, that came all of a sudden. And so yes. you know, sort of put us in the spotlight. And I think you know, with that, one of the lessons learned that I'm hoping uh, now that the uh, United States has rejoined some of the yes. other global uh, dialogue that there is more of an alignment incentives that we often haven't had before. And, I, and I'm hoping that um, that will be something that, that we remind us about sort of lessons learned and how to be more creative in that process yes. too. You, yeah. you are absolutely right because we've never scaled technologies while, while we are in development. That's what happened with vaccine. And that was the only reason. There's a one last comment I'll, I'll make, uh, which Paul actually raised. I think it's a, probably the most important comment around water. I think the water is gonna be our biggest problem moving forward. Water is polluted in the United States too. We actually drink all of us. We drink Prozac and metformin and acetaminophen and you know, a number of these drugs and the technologies that are used currently to clean that are not good enough. And, and, and I think that has to, that has to change. So much of the carcinogenic effect that you see cancer rising, it's coming from these types of pollutants that are in the water supply, uh, you know, all across the world. It's worse in, in low income countries, but it's, it's really not so great in, in, in high income countries as well. So I think that's my quick comment on that. And one thing I would say that I'm proud to build the platforms, two platforms we built, one detects all of these things, the, the chemicals in the water and, and the viruses and bacteria and all that stuff. And then the second technology, our drug discovery technology actually can take it out, specifically the chemicals. So that's our, our next uh, project after we finish the health project. <laughs> can, I add one, can I add one thing that I'm so, I'm, I'm delighted to hear about that. Pam, that is really terrific what you are doing. And, you know, it occurred to me, excuse me, you're right about uh, how we were able to scale up this technology so quickly and roll it out. I mean, it's only been a year and a quarter or so since. I mean, it's really just amazing. And and the thought that I had was, uh, why can't we, this is a bigger question, but why can't we take that kind of a collective effort where everyone, as Gail said, everyone's interests are aligned and we're all rowing in the same direction to take on uh, other big things like uh, cancer, for example, uh, heart disease, leukemia, and Alzheimer's, a big Alzheimer's breakthrough just uh, yesterday. These are big killers too. And yet, to, so the, the, the pandemic scared the pants off of everybody, but, uh, you know, cancer, my gosh, uh, what would it take uh, Pam, well, or anybody to get that kind of collective effort to... Uh, yeah. and, and Paul, Paul, you're very right. It's, it's it, what, what COVID has done is it shook us up that actually action can be taken because it's not only the water pollution, the, the other, uh, other uh, illnesses that actually can produce a lot of, uh, of, uh, of deaths, 
Yeah. But uh, only now we can see that governments can really act uh, on them in, in, and they can actually decide to act in the moral side or not. You know, there's certain countries that are locking down all their people for control, others are doing. And I know that Abib is, is, uh, is lifting that because he has a lot to say. I know we are all very eager to hear you, Abib. No, I, I was going to add another example of something that is positive here. Uh, virtually overnight, uh, businesses and governments had to switch to working remotely. And, you know, what you saw is customers moved to buying digitally, employees switched overnight to working remotely, companies started improving operations, leveraging emerging technologies like AI, which was already underway. And we literally leapfrogged uh, digital adoption by five to seven years in a matter of months, uh, you know, since last year. So, you know, that's something that is very profound. Um, and, you know, as you guys were talking about technology's impact on healthcare, uh, but across the society, it's been pretty transformative. You know, as we got into the pandemic last year, U.S. productivity in Q2 rose by 10.6% followed by a 4.6% increase in Q3. And, and that is the largest six-month increase in the United States since 1965. So there's no question in my mind that on, on all fronts, we are not going back to normal. We're going back and we're moving forward to a new normal in a brave new digital world that's going to, that is going to, uh, Paul, result in some fast and furious uh, solutions for the kinds of deadly diseases or killers that you talked about. It's just that we've become somewhat immune to them uh, and they claim so many lives year after year after year. But I think this has to be a wake up call that what we did with the vaccines, you know, with COVID, I and mean, that has to be replicated in terms of a new way of thinking, new application of technology and healthcare across the diseases you talked about. Well, that's a good point. So you think we're you think we're immune to things like cancer because it's so common and we've had it so long that sort of the way we, I suppose, psychologically react to it is different than the uh, pandemic. Gail, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no worries. I was going to ask sort of a similar, so I'm going to start taking a sociological purview yeah. of this, right? Yeah. One of the things that this pandemic is different and other, uh, for other sort of diseases that have come out, it's not just the chronicity of it, but it's the fact that it affected everybody, right? It's, it's not a, it's, it's not just an income disparity that affects more or less. It, everybody was vulnerable. I think that's the difference. Everybody was vulnerable. Everybody had, so equal opportunity disease, and, and good or bad. And so with that said, I think there was this, this, this huge wake up call for everyone says, oh, it's not just my backyard, it's actually my front yard. And then I want to also pull out something that we, you know, we sort of touched upon. And, and you know, I, again, I, my, my background is actually in philosophy. So I'm, I'm going to sort of, yeah, sort of talk about sort of situational ethics on this. It says, we talked about this whole morality and new morality. I'll have to be really honest. You know, one of the things that I've seen, is, as much as it's actually not just good for people, it's actually good for business. And that's where that that's why I saw sort of forced alignment is, is that we now see that we're, we're trying to help, but we realize that if we don't, if we don't raise all boats on, on this, on the, on the, on the wide ocean, then we're all going to sink. It's, it's, it's about raising all boats. And that's different. That's that interdependency that we hadn't felt before, whether it's supply chain, whether it has to do with, with securities of, of, of the resources, natural or unmet resources. I think that's where we've now really realized huge wake up call, how interdependent we are as, a, as, as countries, as people. Exactly. As, as a world, because when I see, I, I, we can say that the, the chaos theory or, or, or the butterfly effect of the chaos theory is really taking effect that is, when a, a butterfly flutters its wings in one side of the world, it can affect, it can create a, a tsunami on the other side. So uh, collaboration, uh, whether you're rich or poor, uh, developed or undeveloped, it doesn't matter. We're all affected. And so collaboration yeah. is uh, number 17, and it's uh, like number one in, uh, in, in all we are going to be doing about all uh, that, about this.
I just just wanted to make uh, two comments to what Paul and Gail mentioned. Uh, One is around, you know, cancer, uh, whether, you know, we can make a dent like we we worked, how we worked with COVID. Uh, You know, it was happening actually prior to COVID in a sort of a smaller scale. Uh, There was a heavy investment in really detecting, you know, cancer earlier. Uh, as you may have heard about, were like a liquid biopsy, you know, mega companies like Grail, you know, two billion dollars invested, and you know, others. So um, that ha- that trend has been continuing. With COVID, it got even bigger. Um, so I believe that the co- the cancer, for the most part, has become more of a chronic disease. But we still have a way to go. Now, new technologies, novel technologies around. Uh, CRISPR to uh, cell gene therapy, uh, those technologies actually are going to cure cancer or other diseases. Now, the challenge there is investment takes billions of dollars and anywhere from 10 to 20, 30 years to really get to those discoveries. Uh, We have to figure out how to pay for it. And if it's a one-time cure, uh, how do you pay for that? How do you put a price on and you cannot expect uh, the the industry to uh, bear that cost because.